I'll get my shoes and out the door. Five, I'm alive. Six, seven, eight, feeling great. Hello, BYWD Tribe. This is Dr. Noah. We wanted to make you aware of our never-before-featured Product of the Month and newly released Book of the Month for April 2018. Keep in mind, all the links, discount codes, and special offers for the product and book will be listed in the show notes in iTunes, in our weekly newsletter, and on our website at www.beyondyourwildestgenes.com at the Listen Now tab. Our product of the month is Mother Dirt. Mother Dirt is a line of biome-friendly, personal care products focused on restoring and maintaining the delicate balance of your skin biome. Our book of the month is Breathe, the simple, revolutionary 14-day program to improve your mental and physical health by Dr. Belisa Vranich. Both Jasmina from Mother Dirt and Dr. Belisa Vranich discussing our newest book can be heard on the Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast during the month of of April. Hello and welcome back to Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. My name is Dr. Noah DeCoyer and I'm your co-host. Today our guest is my friend and repeat interviewee Jason Prahl. I encourage you to go back to the BYWG archives on our YouTube channel and listen to our first podcast we did on July 3rd, 2017. That's where you can get more of Jason's personal story and who he is, his background. Uh, but Jason, it's great to talk to you. How are you? I'm doing well. Uh, and and by the way, can I just tell you how much I love the title of your podcast? Yeah. I think it's freaking great. <laughs> I, I I I I to this day I still am very appreciative of Dr. Mike uh, uh, coming up with that title. <laughs> you know, it's it's fantastic. Well, and now that we're moving beyond the gene, right, and we're getting to epigenetics, it is it just makes even more sense. So it's it's fantastic. I love it. It is great. Let me let me do your bio and let me ask you this question first, Jason. How many miles have you logged in in the last two years? Oh, my gosh. I mean, it's uh, – I have no idea at this point. I mean, to put it this way, we've been around – we've been to probably 30, 30 different cities uh, around the U.S. and, and uh, all around the world. So it's, it's up there, which is kind of cool. <laughs> Jason is a longevity and optimal health practitioner who works remotely with individuals around the world to provide solutions for those struggling with weight loss or suffering from complex health issues that their doctors have been unable to resolve. In May, he's releasing a free online documentary film series called The Human Longevity Project, which is set to uncover the complex mechanisms of chronic disease and aging and the true nature of longevity in our modern world. So here we are. The release of the Human Longevity Project is right around the corner. Uh, if any of you follow Jason on social media, you'll see where he's been, and it's a pretty fascinating journey. So my first question for you, Jason, is how and why did you decide to put this film series together? Um, well, I'm, I'm questioning that myself right now because <laughs> <laughs> we are in the depths of, of putting it together. But um, honestly, one of the things that, that – I kind of recognized in sort of the integrative health in integrative medicine world was that, you know, we're, we're spending a lot of effort right now on trying to bring people back to a state of balance and a state of health. Um, and I think what we really need is, is a, is a more comprehensive education on how to avoid disease, how to remain healthy and how to sort of rebuild health because building health is, is a different concept than, fixing disease states or imbalances, right? So they, they, they can go hand in hand. Um, I would always suggest that we you know, implement a health regimen uh, along with our disease management met regimen. Um, but, you know, it's just fascinating. When you look around the world, you don't see, you know, in some of these places, you don't see chronic disease. You don't see these hormonal imbalances. You don't see Alzheimer's and dementia. You don't see cancers at the rate that we have them. So, you know, the big question is, is, is why what's going on what are they doing so right and what are we doing so wrong and there's been some study into this to some degree but i don't you know everything that i've seen from a a, a lifestyle evaluation of some of these places where people are living a long time and and also the lifestyle evalu evaluation of what we're doing here in the u.s and in the western countries it just didn't seem to go deep enough for me and so i wanted to really dig into that and show what these environments and what these lifestyles look like around the world in through the film because um you know we can write articles about it we can write blogs we can take pictures but i think through the film we can really see 
what's going on. In fact, I'm actually going through uh, an interview right now and, and editing an interview uh, of a woman in Costa Rica, and you know she's sitting on her front porch and. Uh, during the interview, like there's a rooster that's interrupting a lot of the talk and there's like chickens walking by and a little piglet, like it goes into the frame. Right. And this is just in their back porch. So, you know, how many people do we know that live like that around the U S definitely not in the cities. So, you know, we wanted to show this and I think it, it, it becomes that much more powerful when we can show these people, hear their stories, hear how they grew up. And all of a sudden it's a really clear picture of why our health has gone so far south. So, Jason, what are we going to call these areas that you visited across the world? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, there are certainly interesting areas that I think people are familiar with. Um, we, we went around the world to not explore the areas, right? That wasn't really our interest, um, to study certain regions around the world, because to me, that's not really that important. Um, we, we looked at these places where people uh, live a long time to really get a sense for what they do individually and what the environment looks like, because I think that's where the, the magic is. It's not in, there's no, in my opinion, there's no real reason an, a specific area can, can live a long time and not live a long time. It's all about what they're doing. And, you know, a good example of this is Guernsey, right? Guernsey is this little tiny island in, in the, in the, in the uh, UK, in the English channel, that they're actually intentionally trying to become sort of a longevity region, a longevity zone. And so it just kind of shows you that it's not the magic of, of, a, of a place. It's really what the people are doing. And so, you know, uh, we can call them longevity zones, longevity regions. Um, but at the end of the day, too, uh, what I can tell you is, is that from our experience in traveling to a lot of these places around the world, um, these places that you tend to see a lot of longevity are actually declining in their health and in their, in their longevity sort of statistics uh, because of the westernization of, of a lot of these regions. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, we may actually soon be left with no real regions where we see elevated levels of, of longevity and good health. And it may be sort of more disparate uh, individuals in uh, all kinds of regions around the world um, that we see living to 100. And, and, and the other interesting aspect is, is that, you know, there's there's been areas around the world that have been studied um, and sort of proclaimed as longevity regions. But at the end of the day, we have places in the Amazon. We've got tribes around the world. We've got, you know, in the Himalayas, we've got places where people are living a long time. So there's nothing special about a region, I don't think, other than what the environment is looking like in that region and what people are doing. Do, do you think it's possible to intentionally create a longevity zone? 100%. I, I think uh, without a doubt. Um, now, is it easy? Probably not, um, especially when, you, when it comes to big city living you know i think i think it's more likely to happen when you have smaller communities um and i think unfortunately due to the nature of technology and advancements and in, in, in a lot of things that make our lives easier and more comfortable we have to intentionally subvert some of that uh convenience right i mean that's that's where we're gonna have to go and then i think due to the nature of technology we're gonna have to implement certain technologies that will sort of count counteract some of the negative aspects of other technologies, right? So a good example of this might be uh, the aura ring, right? Which is just a ring that goes on your finger that you, that tracks your sleep and your heart rate variability and kind of gives you a sense of where you're at in your health status. You know, another good example might be infrared saunas uh, or even traditional Swedish saunas too. But, but these are some of the things I think we're going to have to implement to offset some of the damaging aspects of a convenient life that we've built around ourselves. And we may have to incorporate some inconvenience, um, and when I say inconvenience, it's really not that inconvenient, right? Planting a garden for some people might seem inconvenient. But if you really break it down, going into your backyard and picking a cucumber is a heck of a lot more convenient than running to the store, picking something up, you know, checking out, running your credit card, you know, driving home, unpacking the groceries, putting it in the refrigerator, right? Like, that's a lot more inconvenient than growing your vegetables. It's just a, a short-term inconvenience, right? And especially if you don't know how to do something, it may seem inconvenient at first. So I think we just have to kind of switch our priorities. But but to answer your question, I think it's 100% um, uh, possible, and I think it's exactly what we're going to see going forward. Um, because as you as I pointed out, Guernsey itself is, has literally made that an intention. Um, so so I think it's going to happen. That's that's great news. Now let's let's get right into the nitty gritty. You've been all over the place. Um, what are the few, I don't know, three, four, five things that you've learned dietarily uh, 
that people practice on a regular basis in these these longevity zones? Yeah, I think um, – I mean first and foremost, they 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 ate and, – and, and I have to say that some of this – that the answer that I'm giving you is actually a reflection of the past. You know, So let's say 1940s, 1950s because that's when things were maintained. They're actually slowly degrading. So some of this may not even apply today in a lot of these places. Um, but – you know, they ate organic food, you know, um, they ate all kinds of food, you know, um, in, in, uh, Samara, Costa Rica, uh, there's a, Christina is telling me about how she, how they ate lowland paca and, you know, deer, because that's what was around in the mountains and they used uh, pig fat to cook, you know, so they ate meat, uh, but they also ate lots of other things like beans and, uh, you know, fruits and rice and, and all kinds of stuff. So, you know, plantains and cassava. But interestingly, she's talking about she she in the interview if you if you watch the film, you'll see that she talks about how they ate some things that that people don't eat anymore, even in those regions, um, because they just forgot how. They forgot that you could or they 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 don't use them. Um things like cassava leaves, uh the squash flower, the flower from the squash. Um you know, these are things that they used to eat because they could and because they knew how to uh, how to use them, um, you know, and, and she actually says in our interview, she says that people around the region don't eat that way anymore. You know, they're, they're eating from more packaged foods. Um, they have big business. They have commercialization. So it's shifting. But but the overarching theme is that they ate organic because that's all they had. Um, they ate local uh, because that was the way to do it. They, in, in some of these places, they didn't have electricity until 1950 or 1970. So that means they didn't have refrigeration. They didn't have freezers. You couldn't really, you know, make ice <laughs> without electricity, right? So, um, so they ate a much different way because they were they had to, and that's how humans ate for most of our existence, right? So, so they ate seasonally. They ate whatever was around them. They didn't have any dogmas about do I eat a ketogenic diet or do I eat a vegetarian vegan diet? Do I, do I, do I, you know, eliminate FODMAPs? Do I want to restrict lectins? You know, they didn't have that. Um, they didn't have that philosophy. And so I think that's an interesting way to look at things. And it doesn't mean that, that we have to do that here in the U S in, in modern culture. It just means that we, we need to, to take a, view, a different viewpoint on food. Um, and we need to stop blaming food for our problems. And instead, we need to grow food and consume food and, you know, uh, process food the way that is in harmony with our biology. What, what's your take, Jason, um, in your and in your specialized con, uh, context on nutrient diversity? Did these people only eat a few things or did they eat a wide variety of fruits and vegetables? What, is there any kind of common yeah. themes there? That's a very interesting question. And I think, um, so I think on first glance, it would look like they ate the same types of foods, right? So in Costa Rica, for example, they would eat beans and rice pretty consistently and corn pretty consistently right? because it grew consistently. Um, but at the same time, they were also eating different fruits when like sometimes it's mango season and they would eat lots of mangoes during that season. And then it would be um, papaya season and they would switch over into papaya season, right? So but then again, if you, you know, going back to Christina's interview, she's talking about squash flowers and cassava leaves. And so I think their staples for most places were pretty consistent. Um, but then they ate, they got a lot of diversity when it comes to, you know, some of these other little things, you know, in, in, uh, in Italy, uh, in some of the places we were in Italy, you know, I mean, cheese is pretty common. Uh, uh, pasta was pretty common. Um, tomatoes are pretty common, but then they ate all these little other things as well. So I think they got a much bigger diversity than us, but they also had pretty strong staples as well. So I think it's sort of a little mix. And I think when and, and because they ate seasonally, they ha they were forced to, to in include diversity, right? I mean, it wasn't always fish season, for example. It wasn't always cheese season, for example, right? Um, so there was there was seasonality to what they did. Um, and when when it comes to meat in particular, there seemed to be a strong seasonality aspect of, of, of meat and, and fruits. So, yeah, I think they were forced to rotate. I think they, they got diversity, and I think they had pretty strong staples. And diversity doesn't mean that they're eating copious amounts of things, too. Right? It could be almost like exactly. a seasoning, too, right? Like little bits of a lot of different things, right? 
Exactly. And I think what's, what's really cool to think about is the cyclical nature of these things, right? I mean, because, you know, you and I, if we were to try to eat diverse, we would typically make a salad maybe would be a good, good, good way to include diversity or to make a smoothie and put a bunch of stuff in it, right? And while, while I don't think that's a bad thing, I also think that there's probably some benefits that, you know, when, when it comes to understanding why there's benefits, it's probably a really complex answer. But I think there's really strong benefits to eating in a cyclical fashion, right? And, um, you know, when it's mango season, they probably ate tons of mangoes because they were there, right? I mean, if, if you got, I mean, if you're, if you're making and growing your own food, um, probably pretty smart thing to do to when it's mango season, go pick a bunch of mangoes, <laughs> right? So you're not going to say, oh, well, it's not a good thing here. You know, I mean, you're going to do what, what's, a, and, and eat what's around you. So, um, I think there's a really strong benefit to eating in a cyclical fashion and in some of these small doses that they, I mean, they're not going to eat, you know, boatloads of squash flour, right? <laughs> but they are going to use it intelligently and they they probably understood medicinal aspects of things. Um, and I'll give you a, a really good example of a medicinal aspect. They, in, in Costa Rica, they would get dengue fever. Uh, um, that's fairly common. Because there's a bunch of mosquitoes and the, they live in the mountains and the mosquitoes have seasons. So there's a seasonality component to dengue. And they would use uh, papaya leaf. They would make papaya leaf tea when somebody got dengue. And for three or four days, they'd feel like crap. Uh, but then they would recover. You know. And what we know now about the immune system is these challenges to the immune system seem to build robustness in the immune system. right? They seem to build that resilience in the immune system. So w when you get infections of these type of things... It, it seems to me, you know, based on the science that's coming out and that has come out and, and by talking to some of the, the best immunologists around the world, that these bouts of infection and challenging the immune system that keeps them and prevents them from getting, you know, sensitive to foods and sensitive to chemicals and all these things that we are so sensitive to these, these days in the U.S., right? Because our immune systems haven't been challenged in the right way. They're being challenged in the wrong way, which is GMO foods, you know, pesticides, herbicides, glyphosates, you know, chemicals and metals and all these things. We we're being challenged in the wrong things. They were challenged with the way nature intended, which is sort of these little infections here and there. And they use natural ways to help the body deal with them, which eventually led to robustness over time. It's a, it's a concept that we've lost in our modern society, for sure, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. For sure. Now, did these, did these, did you see in these places a lot of times when they were forced to fast too, or is that is that gone by the wayside? Is that something in their past history? These longevity zones. Yeah, I think I think a lot of them were were went through periods where they they may have been forced to fast, um, particularly during war torn regions and war torn times. Um, you know, there was we did talk to people that had, I mean, severe fasting, um, really severe fasting. So. That was definitely incorporated, but I think more uh, universally, there was a they they were doing sort of intermittent fasting, right? This was just their common way of of operating because they they went to bed at seven or eight p.m. because that's when it got dark and they weren't using you know artificial lights to keep them up and uh, they weren't watching TV, right? So they would they would go to bed at seven or eight p.m. They would wake up around probably five or six a.m. because that's when they had to do things in the in the to, to harvest and garden and you know that kind of thing so i mean right there you're talking about a, a you know 10 or 12 hour fast minimum um and that's if they if they ate right away when they got up so i think intermittent fasting was very very common i think you know calorie restriction and when i say that i don't mean dieting i mean just putting a lid on the amount of food you you ate um was common because why would you eat more than you needed because that just means you have to grow more food and work harder, right? So you would never really overconsume because that just meant you had to do more work. So I think they kept their, their food under control and they, they had a really good intelligent way to fast, which is now bearing out in our Western research, right? We're showing the intermittent fasting so beneficial and, and eating during certain windows of the day is beneficial. So they just did that naturally. Yeah, I think that's some of the most fascinating aspects of these zones is that they just use they just used common sense. Right. You know, we've yeah. lost common sense over time. Uh, it's amazing. Now, what about what about lifestyle habits in these areas? Some consistencies throughout these areas. I mean, they they all of them 
and I think you'll see this in any region that lives uh, in a more traditional way, which th that they incorporated was a community, right? So they, they work together. They, the family unit was really strong because that's, that provided safety, security, and made everything easier. So, you know, their family was all around them. Um, you know, the grandparents lived in the home. They often watched um, and took care of the, the, the young kids. Uh, because the uh, the parents and the adults were out doing work, you know, whether it be harvesting crops or taking care of the animals that they had or or going to get water from the stream, um, building things and maintaining the household, that was common. And so the grandparents were incorporated. The, the whole family dynamic was was there. Um, and the, the, the community within the villages was very strong. Um, we were talking to one guy in Greece, and he said sometimes we'd I would walk to work, uh, to go to work, and uh, I would see a friend. Uh, on the way, and of course he was walking, and so he would just stop and talk to his friend. And sometimes they'd talk for like four or five hours, and he just wouldn't go to work, right? Because you don't have a boss that's going to reprimand you. You know, you're not you're not collecting a paycheck. It was just like, well, if it didn't get done today, it would get done tomorrow. Uh, I have a more important thing to do here, which is to talk to my friend. And so they just, and then when somebody needed a house built or something happened, and like they they needed to repair something for somebody, they would all literally get together and help build or repair or do something for this other person. And there was no repayment system. There was no, you know, you owe me. There's no loans. There's no money. There's no transaction. It was like, well, this person needs help building something or uh, whatever. And so we're all going to get together and do it. So you saw a really, really strong sense of community. And I think this is why when I say that it, can we intentionally, you know, produce a longevity zone or region, um, I think this is what it's going to take. It's going to take a smaller community because um, that's, where you hold people accountable and you hold yourself accountable, right? Um, in these big cities, you can essentially remain anonymous, right? You can do all kinds of nasty things. You can swear at somebody on the phone. You can, you know, you can be whoever you want and there's no repercussions other than maybe internal. And so we don't feel it as, as much. And so I think when you have a small community, and this is, this is also the reason I think that churches and religious groups um, tend to be uh, more communal, more healthy in in so many ways around the world, because there's a sense of community built into that. Um, so I think the community really was the most powerful thing that that we saw when we went to all these places. How about exercise habits? <laughs> I mean, this is the funniest one. Um, you know, when we talk to people about exercise, I mean, to some degree, they almost laugh, right? They're like, "What are you talking about, exercise?" Um, because everything was exercise for them, right? When they uh, they would have to go collect the squashes, well, they would take two or three wheelbarrows and go pick the squashes and bring them back home, right? I mean, they were constantly moving. Uh, everything they did was walking, was uh, gardening, was uh, walking down. Like in in uh, in Italy, they would go from the mountainous region um, and take the the cheeses that they that they they uh, made, and then they would take them down to the sea. And in order to do that, it was like it was usually the the teenagers, like the the ten to fifteen or eighteen year old kids that would that would make this trek, and they would take all this cheese and they'd walk down the mountain forty kilometers, forty kilometers. I mean, that's like thirty miles or whatever, twenty six miles, right? So um, they would they would walk down to the sea. They would exchange the cheese for fish, and then they'd walk back up to the mountain villages and they'd deliver the fish. So, I mean, talk about exercise. How many people do you know that walk? 20 plus miles with, with, uh, you know, things in hand <laughs> each way. Right. Um, and the interesting thing was, is that at some point, I think in the seventies in, in this Italian, these Italian villages, they started to incorporate schools, right? So they had a, a stronger educational system. Well, that's, that's great to advance society, but those kids were now no longer making those tracks. Right. So you, this is, this is how we can see things shift and it's not a matter of good or bad. I mean, you know, education is great and, and schools can be a very good thing for society. But the question is, is how do we incorporate more of what was being done when we start to progress, you know, with society? How do we walk more? How do we, how do we just get general exercise throughout the day and regularly, but none of them lifted weights. None of them did high intensity interval training. None of them did Pilates or yoga. Um, uh, all the things I love, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I know, but, but this begs the question, right? So, the question is, is are, it's not, are those things good or bad? The question is, is based on our current lifestyles here in the U.S. and in the West in general, how do we, 
how do we incorporate some things maybe a little differently to garner the same benefits, right? So this is the big question. This is one of the main reasons we want to make this film was we'll never be, you know, these Italian villages. We'll never go back back to that. Um, it's just not possible based on the way society's progressed, um, nor would we necessarily want to. So the question becomes, what can we learn from these places and these people? And how do we incorporate that into our modern life, right? How do we bring that stuff forward? Because we're not going to go back. So I think this is the, it's, it's, we can look at those places and learn from them, but we can't duplicate what they're doing. You know, we, we, we just can't. Um, so how do we, how do we, how do we tweak it in our, in our world? And how do we incorporate some of the most important things and also put things in perspective so that we can garner all these benefits? So I think this is where, you know, when we do something like high, high intensity interval training, very, very good thing, right? But maybe we need to do more walking too, right? Uh, maybe we need to incorporate incorporate more community, maybe we incorporate more play and more fun uh, in our workouts, right? So uh, I think I think the best advice I've heard in terms of exercise, you know, when somebody asks what's the best exercise for longevity, um, I think I think the answer is, is whatever is going to bring you the most joy, whatever you have fun doing. I think that's the answer, you know, because if you hate what you're doing, uh, I think that's going to trump uh, the benefits, uh, the perceived benefits of whatever you're doing. So, so how do we bring some of this back into our world, knowing that our world is a little different? I, I get the idea that this is the crux of this entire project is, is to look at these areas and in interview people in the United States, the, all these health experts that I know are on the, on the, the list of people you interviewed and how do we integrate and best use those in our modern society? Is that a fair statement? Yeah. I mean, and, and, and not only that, what are we doing wrong? Because there's things we're doing now that nobody else has ever done, right? I mean, nobody's, nobody in, in these past societies or these cultural you know, societies have incorporated you know, screens like we have. So, and screens aren't going away, right? Like, I mean, your, your phone and your laptop and your computer and all these things, they're not gonna go away. So how do we use them intelligently? How do we subvert and, and avoid some of the pitfalls of some of these things? Um, so I think we have to analyze both both aspects of this, both sides of the coin. What are they? What is? What are all these people doing right in these places where they're living a long time? And what are we doing wrong? And how do we? How do we sort of marry those those understandings so that we can make the best decisions and create the best lifestyle for ourselves here? And this is where a lot of the experts, you know, have a lot of great knowledge and understanding, as well as some of these people around the world um, that are seeing the changes in their work in the, in their culture. They're actually seeing some of the Western influence. And so they have the, a very unique perspective from their standpoint, you know, um, about how the modern technologies and the Western, you know, culture is influencing uh, their societies in a negative way. Are there, are there any other wisdoms that come to mind while we're speaking that, um, that you think our audience needs to hear? Yeah, I think I think the most powerful one for me when I when I was speaking to these people and I, I asked them, you know, what's the most uh, the best advice you can give me to live a long, healthy, happy life? Um, almost every elderly person we talked to said, um, you know, hold no grudges and maintain good relationships with those around you. I think when you have like ninety plus percent of the people that you talk to say that, um, all of a sudden it becomes really important, right? Um, this is something we kind of we talk about in, in the health circles here in the U.S. and we, but I think we kind of pass it over a little bit too. I think we we, we just kind of you know glance at it, you know, and, and glaze over it. But it really hit home for me when I'm talking to these people how important that really is. It gives you a sense of of happiness, a sense of security, a sense of uh, well-being, right? Um, and I think that's just so important because everything that I see around us, um, we have we have a lot of strife we've got a lot of combating you know i mean with our political landscape and our corporate landscape and our financial landscape um uh, food landscape we've got a lot of areas where we where we butt heads with with other people and i think if we hold on to that especially over the long term i think this is this is contributing to disease more than than we recognize uh, and so I think that was just a really powerful take home message for me was to hear these people say that that's the most important thing for them. I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree. I could not agree 
more with that. It's something that I could certainly work on. I don't know anybody around me that can't can't work on holding grudges or um, creating better and stronger and deeper relationships. Yeah, I mean, it's hard. That's the hard work, right? I mean, to some degree, switching over to a healthier diet is easier, right? I mean, doing doing that work, I think, is is hard, and I think it's it's because it's emotionally hard, right? It's, it's emotionally difficult to forgive somebody that's hurt you, you know, uh, to to whether it be you know parental figures from your youth um, or somebody at work that you just can't stand, right? I mean, at the end of the day, we're we're just put in so many situations now where we're not necessarily choosing our tribe, right? You didn't choose your parents, you didn't choose your siblings, you didn't, you know, we don't choose our coworkers a lot of the time unless we're sort of working for ourselves. So we're just put in a lot of situations where we're we're just butting heads with people and because that's we didn't choose to be in their in their life, so to speak. And so the question is is how do we how do we sit with that? And how do we how do we become okay with that? And how do we forgive and how do we find compassion for other people? And how do we how do we just let go of some of this stuff, right? And so I think this is just something we're not taught in our culture of how to deal with. And I think this is a, a part of the other cultures where they have a big advantage. They have elders, they have grandparents, they have people that that are teaching them these these sort of um, self mastery, right? The art of living. Um, a lot of these type of things that we're just not they're not they're not made a focus in our culture. So it's it's the tough stuff. That's the hard work. But I think it's so powerful and, and the more we can focus on that, um, the healthier we'll all be. I agree. The more I look at my my person and even the people that I coach and teach and, and see on a daily basis, the food is getting to be easier and, and easier compared to all these other things that right. you need to do to be healthy, without a doubt. Yeah. Now, is there is there one, so say if there's somebody, a world traveler listening to the podcast here, is there one place that totally blew your mind that you loved the most, that you appreciated the most, uh, that you would go back again? Um, well, I mean, this isn't really, uh, it, this wasn't really a part of our documentary, but um, just due to my own sort of personal travels, mm -hmm. um, uh, Reykjavik, Iceland, to me, is one of the coolest places. Um, they, because it's sort of modern, um, but yet holds on to a small community, like they don't lock their doors at night, you know? Um, and so it's sort of this blend of like new civilization combined with old world values. Um, so that's a really cool place. But, um, in, in terms of the places we, we went, Ikaria, Greece, uh, the island of Ikaria, uh, which is kind of near, um, it, it's just south of Oh gosh, that's the city. I'm losing it. Anyway, um, but it, it, Ikaria is a mountainous island, and it's not a tourist place, and it's still got these villages that that are just they feel old, they feel slow, they feel natural, um, and because it's a mountainous island, there is no monocrop. So there's no monocrops there, which means that there's no reason to have pesticides and herbicides. So this is one of the few places that I've been to where you're kind of, uh, it's untouched from a chemical sp perspective, or at least it has been in the past. It's probably slowly moving away from that. But, you know, the honey that the bees produce there have actually been shown to have not have any glyphosate, uh, which is... Uh, shouldn't be remarkable, but it is remarkable because I think there was a study that came out that looked at honey in the U.S and every honey they tested had glyphosate, you know, even the quote-unquote organic, because glyphosate just ends up getting everywhere. So that was a really cool place. And time seemed to just slow down and stop there. And they have, um, they've got these, these uh, uh, therapeutic baths there, um, these hot springs that you can just literally just go walk down to the beach and go sit in. You know, there's no fee. There's no, like, here we would, in the U.S., we'd monetize the heck out of that, right? Like, there'd be right. tickets, there'd be lines, you have to make reservations, like, um, but there, no, you just walk down to the beach and you go you go find the pool and you just sit in it. Um, and so they have all kinds of different healing properties. They've got some that are high in sulfur, they've got some that are high in sort of radioactive uh, elements that, that heal rheumatism and all these things. And so, just a really cool place to get away from the, all the tourists, aspects of, of, of Greece, if you will. And, and um, just a really, uh, the, the Ikarians are really fabulous people um, because they, 
they have certain qualities that you just find sort of amazing. Um, they say that they have the patience to outlast a mule. Um, that we, we be driving and somebody would stop and talk to their friend on the side of the road and there'd be a car just sitting behind them for like two or three or four minutes. Uh, they wouldn't honk, they wouldn't go around and they just sit there and wait. <laughs> so like in the US, if you don't go after a green light after like two seconds in New York, you just get, you know, horns blazing at you. So um, it's just fascinating to see uh, a different side of humanity, <laughs> which is full of patience, compassion, uh, you know, uh, helping one another. Um, pretty cool. I've, I'm glad you brought up bees because uh, m- me and my family we have six beehives, so we raise bees. Oh wow! But it's our own honey. That's... Now, I was, are there other zones that, uh, or do they all have their own bees and people beekeep? Like, is that a constant theme, or not? Not so much, at least from what you saw. <laughs> Yeah, we didn't really see that. Um, it, I think Ikaria was was a pretty strong bee uh, community, but um, didn't see it in in any of the other places that we were at. Um, but I mean, I, I think it's amazing that you actually have your own bees because I, I mean, you probably are aware of this, but it's it's worth noting that this is one of the big issues that we have right now. I mean, yes. if we start, I mean, we've lost so much of the bee community. Um, Mostly because they can't get propolis, they, which means they can't protect themselves. Their immune systems are weak, which means they get subjected to parasites. And, and you know, we're losing the colonies. Um, that's a big, big problem. I don't. I mean, I don't even. I wouldn't even say that I recognize how big of a problem that is. But because um, I don't study bees super thoroughly, but from everybody I know that's sort of an expert in the bee community, I mean, they're like they're kind of scared. You know, I mean, we're we're at the eleventh hour here, yeah. and it's not good, and we need to fix this. So. I mean, it's kind of scary when you talk about losing the bee population because the entire ecosystem collapses, the entire food system collapses. You know, we can't live if we lose if we lose the bees. I think it was uh, Schauberger, right, who said uh, if we lo- if we lose the bees or the trees, we're done. Yep. Um, so not good. Yeah, I was just just curious when you brought up bees. Well, thanks for answering that. Now I have two final questions for you. One. Uh, when is the free window watching area for uh, time frame for the Human Longevity Project? Yeah, we'll be releasing um, May seventh, I believe, is the date. Um, and we have uh, we've got nine episodes, so um, we will be showing we're showing it for for I think a ten day window um, starting May seventh. So um, it'll be free to watch, and um, we cover all kinds of aspects of health, right? I mean, we talk, we have to get geeky first, right? We got to figure out what the heck is aging? Where does it happen in the body? What is it? Um, because only, only when we start to at least have a semblance of understanding of what aging is in the body, can we then back out all the things that we need to do um, to sort of slow the aging process and be healthy. And so that's really the focus of, of the film is, is not necessarily longevity in and of itself, right? To some degree, we don't really care to live 130 or 150. That's not the, that's not really the goal. Um, I think the more important goal is how do we, how do we live, uh, a life that's full of happiness, full of health, right? Avoiding all these issues that we're, we're seeing. And whenever we kick the bucket, I mean, that's when we go, right? I mean, I don't know anybody personally, you know, in my own life that really has this major goal to just get to 150, right? I mean, cause if you, if that's your goal, and you, again, you hate yourself, you hate everybody around you, you're poisoning and destroying the environment. Um, you know, it doesn't seem like a very good thing. So how do we integrate with nature? How do we, how do we harmonize? How do we, how do we be healthy? How do we avoid disease? Um, I think that's really what we're all shooting for. And I think even the people that, that have a goal to, to reach 150 or 200, I think what they're really saying is, is that I want to be healthy for 150 years, right? I want to be healthy for 200 years. Nobody wants to be to live to 150 and be healthy for 60 of that, and like you know, suffering for 90. That's not a goal, right? So, so we want to really highlight the the lifestyle practices, the dietary practices, the emotional stuff, um, all the things that we can do to facilitate good health, um, so that we can get into our 80s, 90s, perhaps 100 without without too much suffering. I totally couldn't agree. Couldn't agree more. Folks, all the, all the links uh, to the Human Longevity Project will be in the show notes and everywhere else that you need to find it for sure. 
Uh, one last question, Jason. This is just a question I've been asking everybody. Now, it might be different recently because you have so much work getting this project together, but on a normal <laughs> Jason Prowl day, like what, what, what is from waking to going to bed, what does a normal day look like? Routines, rhythms, uh, how, how does that look? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think – I think even right now, when we're going through this crazy process uh, from a work standpoint, I mean, sleep is still a major focus for me. So um, everything and anything I can do to facilitate sleep um, and incorporating meditation into things when they get crazy. But but normally I would say when I'm in a rhythm, um, I really love to get up and immediately go outside, go for a walk, 10 or 15, 20 minutes. Um, that really facilitates a really good day. Um, I, I love to incorporate meditation um, you know even if it's just a 20 minute thing um, once or twice a day that's ideal um, I typically eat breakfast and lunch um, I would try to eat an early dinner um, you know hopefully food ends right around 6 p.m. if not earlier um, and that's kind of the, that's kind of the, the basis of it I usually get a, a workout in um, and that can vary um, I still love going to the gym and getting getting in the sauna what the heck out of, out of myself um some kind of workout whether that be inside or outside um if i'm if i'm in san diego which is typically where i am and, and live uh going to the beach and doing something on the beach whether it be even just laying or reading or doing some sort of workout getting in the ocean um that's kind of my happy place so uh i, I really just try to keep it simple um, I, I don't do a lot of biohacking in, in the traditional sense that, that people might think of it. Um, I eat normal foods, a lot of plants. Um, you know, there's just there's not a lot of magic in, in what I do. Um, I just try to take the basic principles and apply them and have some fun with the rest. Well, that, that sounds right on for me. I've had an interest in this topic for years. I, I'm personally very excited for this video series and uh, I'm so thankful that you were able to hop on. I'm thankful for you being a, a repeat guest and I'm certain we'll have you on again for sure for something. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I really appreciate it. It's always good talking to you. We see eye to eye on so many things. So it's, it's always an easy conversation. You got it. So thank you very much. Uh, link to the Human Longevity Project will be in the show notes. My name is Dr. Noah DeCoya, your co-host, and you are listening to the Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. If you like what you've heard today, please share this with your friends and family and encourage them to subscribe on iTunes. You can sign up for our incredible weekly email at www.beyondyourwildestgenes.com. Thank you. And as my oldest son Hayden says, be awesome and never unawesome. Get my shoes and out the door. Five, I'm alive, six, seven, eight.